Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, it's good to see everybody in, and again, I uh, always like to welcome our television audience, and my, what it thrills our heart as we go out on all these travels, and people come up and say, we never miss a program. We, w we watch you every day. Well, you know, that's quite encouraging because uh, I don't think it's because they like the looks of my face. It's just because they are getting fed from the book. And uh, I had a lady write the other day. She said, I just caught your program a couple years ago. She had been in church all my life until after I watched your first program. I had never read my own Bible. Now she said, I'm in it every day. Well, what more can we ask for? Because if we can just get people to study their own Bible, and uh, all I'm here for is just to enlighten and to maybe clarify, but uh, we want people to study on their own. Because uh, as I've said over and over on the program, old Tyndale said he wanted a copy of the Scriptures in the hands of every plowboy in England. How much education did English plowboys have? Just enough to read, see? And that's all it takes. Okay, now several weeks ago we, we let our television audience know that we've got a book put together of 88 or 90 questions and the answers are all pulled from our past program material and we've had a lot of delays. Of course, that's typical of something like this. But hopefully they're going to send out our first shipment now tomorrow, which will be the 6th of this month. And so for some of you folks who have been waiting and waiting and waiting, be patient. They're finally coming. And uh, we're not doing this to promote income. We're selling them just for cost. But uh, a listener in Indiana has done a tremendous job of uh, putting together questions and uh, the answers out of our past material. Okay, now Iris always likes me to remind you that we are in book 52 because uh, she gets her share of the phone call. And I think a lot of people realize her ministry work is 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and she never complains. And so uh, when you write less than Iris, that is perfectly as it should be. She is such a help to the ministry. She does all of the paperwork, the labeling of the tapes, and uh, everything. I, I don't know how she does it. But anyway, we just thank God for her. But uh, just remember that when you call and she answers the phone and you say, I want the program that was on yesterday, well, I just tell her I want book number 52. And uh, it'll save her a lot of time. Okay, let's get right into where we left off in Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> and we're still dealing with Moses. And by faith now, he has come through 80 years of his lifetime. And he's now leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the first thing they're going to have to confront is the Red Sea. And you know, when we teach Exodus, we, we make it a point that here come the children of Israel. Mountains impassable on both sides, the Egyptian army behind them, and the Red Sea in front of them. And what did God tell them? Well, hurry up and build rafts. Do something so that you can float the Red Sea. No, that's not what God said. He said what? Stand still. Don't do anything. Well, you see, the lesson is salvation is the same way today. When the sinner realizes he's lost and he's hopeless, he doesn't go out and try work and work and work to get saved. He does nothing but stand still and believe in that finished work of the cross. And uh, I know I put it on the program several, maybe several months ago now. Time goes so fast. But I don't think I slept much all that night for just reviewing it in my own mind. The, the unbelievableness of the work of the cross. That it was so perfect, it was so complete, that like creation back there in Genesis 1, you remember I, I tied the two together. 
that when God looked at the finished work of creation, he saw in the last verse of chapter 1 that it was what? Very good. It was perfect. And so what did he do in chapter 2? He rested. There wasn't anything more he could do. It was done. Well, the same thing with the work of the cross. After he had finished it and ascended back to glory, what did he do? Fret and fume. Well, I should have done this. Or I should have done that. No. He sat down. Why? Because it was perfect. And ever since then, what has mankind been trying to do? Smear it by adding this and adding that and one thing or another. But just like Egypt or Israel standing on the shores of the Red Sea, God doesn't say, well, hurry up and do something. He says, stand still. And so here's the verse now in verse 29. By faith. By simply taking God at His word, He opened up the Red Sea, piled up the water on both sides. And listen, do you think those Jews didn't know that that water was stacked up? And that at a moment's notice, the whole thing could come rushing back in? They were just as human as we are. But how did they know that water wouldn't come back? God's word. God said, go through on dry ground. And so it was by faith that they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, not worrying about that water crashing in. But you know, as soon as the last Jew went up on the other side, then what happened? Here it came. And the Egyptians were caught in it. But you see, for the people of faith, they walked in, they walked across on dry ground. Because that's what God said to do. All right, so read the verse again. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as dry land. It wasn't muddy. It wasn't wet. It was like dry land. And then when the Egyptians are saying to do, they, of course, were drowned because the water came back. But you see, that's what it means to take God at his word. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to just simply say, well, God said it and I can depend on it. But this is what God expects. This is what he's looking for. He is simply looking for our believing and trusting in what he has said. All right, let's move on. Verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Now, that's probably one of the things in Scripture that is scoffed as much as anything, isn't it? They scoff at it. They just, the world will not believe that that's all that Israel had to do, would walk around it seven times. But they believed God. Now, again, again, they were just as human as we are. Don't you suppose a lot of those Israelites, as they were marching around that well-fortress city, must have had some scoffing ideas within their own mind? Well, what in the world is this going to do? How in the world is this going to defeat Jericho? But they did it. And it happened. Because God said it would. And you see, we're up against the same thing today. I suppose if, if I get letters of disagreement on anything, more than anything, it's the rapture. And I'm addressing it in my next newsletter. And uh, Laura thought I was a little bit hard on them, but I don't think so. But why can't people accept the concept of the rapture? Because it takes a lot of faith. And I know that. I can see that the unbelieving world thinks we're crazy as loons to think that all of a sudden, someday, God's going to give a shout, a trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to be gone. They can't believe that. Well, I can understand that to a point. It does stretch the imagination. But listen, the Lord himself said back there in Matthew that with God, nothing is impossible. So do you think it's impossible for him to suddenly take every believer off the planet? No. It's not impossible. And he's going to do it. Because the word says he will. But that's where faith comes in. We take it by faith. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. 
But oh, we can believe it because it's what the Word says. All right, so they marched around Jericho. Foolishness in the eyes of men. But God said that's what it took. Now again, to this very day, archaeologists love to argue. Did the walls fall down? Some maintain that they went straight down. But regardless of which way they went, they went. And Jericho was a sitting duck for the Israelites. But it takes faith to believe it. All right? <clears throat> Verse 31. By faith, by just simply believing what she heard, Rahab, a harlot, a woman of ill repute, and yet with what little bit she had heard, what did she do with it? She believed it. In fact, Rahab is one of my favorite subjects for how little faith it takes for God to grab the person. How much did Rahab know? Very little. The only thing she knew was that she had heard that this little nation of people coming out of Egypt had come through the Red Sea on dry ground. She had heard how they had defeated some of the more powerful enemies in the then known world. And on the basis of what she had heard, she what? She believed it. Now, she didn't understand all of Scripture. She didn't understand the sovereignty of God. She didn't understand the grace of God. She didn't understand all the ramifications that we sometimes think people have to know. No, she knew precious little. But what little she knew, she believed it with all her heart because she trusted the God that was behind it. And God did everything else. A perfect example of how God will save a person without really having an awful lot going for him. And so Rahab, perish not with those who had believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Well, why did she receive those Jewish spies? Because Let's go back and look at it. Let's go back. That's got to be in Joshua someplace. <laughs> Joshua, chapter 2. Joshua, chapter 2. And see, this is so simple. You know, mankind has made salvation so difficult. My, we think we've got to put people through this and through that, and then somehow or other they'll get there. Uh-uh, that's not God's way. Joshua, chapter 2. Verse 9. She hasn't had any Bible school. She's never been to Sunday school. She's never been to church. All she has heard are things that had come through the grapevine in Jericho. Verse 9. And she said unto the men, the spies, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land, that is, the land of which Jericho, of course, was the major city, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now here comes in verse 10. For we have what? Heard. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Verse 11, And as soon as we had, what? Heard these things. She didn't even see the results of it. She wasn't sitting on some high point watching the Red Sea open up and Israel coming through. That would have been a little different, wouldn't it? But she had merely heard these things that happened. And what did she do with it? She believed it. See? All right. And so she says, when we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. And so because of what she had heard, knowing that behind it all was the God of Israel, 
God, in turn, responds to her faith. All right, on your way back to Hebrews, let's just stop at another portion of Scripture that speaks of hearing. And that'd be in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Even at the pen of the Apostle Paul, this is the key word. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 10. And it's all the same concept. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith, faith, being able to take God at His word, cometh by what? Hearing, not seeing. Hearing it. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Verse 18, but I say, Paul says, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth, their words unto the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? For first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah, see here we go, back to the Old Testament again, but Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and a gainsaying people. And what was their problem? They couldn't believe. They couldn't believe it. But for those who could believe, God does everything that needs to be done. All right, let's come back again to Hebrews chapter 11. Now he's going to make a, just a quick review of some of the Old Testament characters, most of which we have heard in our Sunday school classes, daily vacation Bible school stories. Verse 32, and Paul says, And what more should I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Now you all know the story of Gideon who the multitudes of Israelites that came out to be a part of his army, God says, send them home. And you know how he went through the elimination process, and how many did he keep? 300. To confront the thousands of the enemy? Ridiculous. You see, God is famous for doing the ridiculous. And it was by their faith that those 300 men defeated the enemy. Barak, Samson. Now, you see, Samson is the epitome of both sides of the coin. He was the man of faith who could do the miraculous. But his unbelief took him down to the depths of despair. But nevertheless, he is a still a good Old Testament example, see? And of uh, Jephthah, David. I don't have to spend any time on David. You all know of his escapades and his conquests and as well as his failures. And Samuel, the prophets. Now verse 33. All of them, all of them, through faith, subdued kingdoms, <coughs> wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. Now, of course, we're jumping up to Daniel in that one, aren't we? But always remember, what was the percentage of even Israel that were men of faith? Precious few. Not all of them. Just the few. And it's always been that way. Only the small percentage were people that could believe what God said. But he always had the few. Still does. And he will until the end. All right? Verse 34. They quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Well, the Old Testament is full of those accounts. How that just a small number of Israelites would defeat vast numbers of the enemy, simply because they did what God told them to do, which may have sounded foolish but they believed what God said. All right, verse 35. 
And again, the whole concept, remember, is that by faith, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured. Now, these are not very pretty verses. You see, we have been lived, we have been living the last several hundred years in Western civilization without really suffering the torture of martyrdom, have we? We, we don't know what it's like. Other areas of the world still do. In fact, I think you've probably read the same thing I have. There have probably been more Christians killed in the last century than almost the previous 18 or 19 before that. And we're not aware of it because we've got it so good. But that's not to say that it can't happen. And so we're reminded that all the way up through human history, people of faith were victorious on the one hand, but they suffered martyrdom on the other. All right, verse 36, others had the trial of cruel mockings and scourgings for their faith. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. In other words, destitute, afflicted, tormented. Not pretty, is it? But that's too often been the lot of the believers. And all you have to do is go back and read a book like the, uh, by Fox's Book of Martyrs. Man, it's frightening what Christians have gone through for their faith. And then what you have to ask ourselves is, could we do it? If all of a sudden we were confronted with torture or recanting, could we stand? And see, this is the lesson that God is able to keep the believer by faith through whatever his circumstances, be they good or bad. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. So why did they do it? Because as we saw earlier in the chapter, because of the recompense of the reward in eternity. And so they wandered, reading on in verse 38, they wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, in the caves of the earth. Now again, if you know anything of history, <clears throat> even of Christendom, my, how many of the true believers were chased from mountain range to mountain range, uprooted. And indeed, they had to eke out a living in caves and dens. Verse 39, And all of these, having obtained a good report through their faith, that's all God was looking for, their faith. And they still did not receive the promise. It's almost enough to make you cry, isn't it? In spite of all that they went through. Now this is again dealing primarily with the Old Testament believers. All of this suffering, and yet they didn't receive the promise, at least not in this life. Because what was the promise that they were all looking for? The kingdom. The heaven on earth. The Old Testament is full of it. How that God would rule and reign on the earth and Israel would be the top nation of the nations. That's what they were looking for. And yet, they never saw it. Was it because they were foolish? No. Because God in His own timing is still going to bring it about. But they went through life lived it by faith, and yet never saw those promises fulfilled on, on earth. Now they're going to see it in the eternal, of course. All right, now let's go into verse 40. For God, having provided some, what's the next word? Better thing for us. This world is nothing compared to what God has in store for us. Nothing. Whether it was the Old Testament living back in antiquity or if it's us living today, the, the comparison is the same. The things of this world are nothing compared with the eternal that's waiting for us. And so God has provided something 
better, and that they without us should not be made perfect, in other words, brought to this place of spiritual completeness. And so history is replete with believers who suffered and died for their faith, never having received that which they thought they were looking for. But oh, it's still out there. It's still coming. And we never have to lose sight of that. All right, and I think we'll, a couple minutes we got left, we'll go on into Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, here we want to take a moment of time to clarify something that even good men have completely muddled the thinking of thousands, if not millions of people. Verse 1 of chapter 12, it's going to ring a bell as soon as you see it. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, all of these heroes of the faith are referred to as a cloud of witnesses. Now I get letter after letter. Does that mean that our loved ones are sitting up there watching us? No way. I know good men say that's true, but I tend to disagree. And it's because of the two different Greek words that we have to compare in looking at this verse. All right. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, the Greek word for witnesses here is martus, M-A-R-T-U-S. And it's the same Greek word that is referred to in John chapter 1, verse 7. Now, I probably won't have time to finish this completely, but we'll at least get a good start on it. John chapter 1 Verse 7, the same Greek word is used. John chapter 1, verse 7. Oh, I'm going to run out of time. Oh, well, that'll just make people tune in tomorrow. <coughs> John chapter 1, verse 7. Speaking of John the Baptist, the same came for a witness, a martus, M-A-R-T-U-S to bear witness of the light. Now that didn't mean that John the Baptist was sitting up there in the stand someplace watching Jesus, but what was he? He was proof that Jesus was the Christ. That's what it meant to be a witness of who he was. All right, we'll pick up the rest in the next program. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Spelding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.